Fantastic. Well, this is uh, week four, our fourth session, and uh, wanted to just to talk about what we wanted to accomplish tonight. So far, we've looked at the apostles, who they were, maybe what some of their personalities were like, and tried to give you a good introduction into maybe how they would conflict with one another, how they might uh, argue with one another, and how they might not be so disposed to all getting along, and at the same time, how they were perfectly picked by Christ to be the team that he needed them to be. So let's see if we can work the slide here. Okay, so when you have um, imperfections in people, it typically drives a wedge between them. Uh, you have somebody who's uh, very loud and outspoken, and somebody else who's very loud and outspoken. It causes conflicts. So this is this is the problem that you have oftentimes when you have groups of people that get together. And it was no different with the disciples. It was no different with the apostles. So you had Christ, who was their um, their head, their leader, who was was trying to make sure that things were working the way they were supposed to work. So, let's see if I can get the right slide here. There we go. Yep, yep. So the disciples that we talked about, um, they were anybody that followed after Christ, and there were lots of them, hundreds and hundreds of them, all wanting for the Messiah to come, all wanting to be free of Roman rule. They wanted that so badly. We talked about it one with another, expecting maybe this person was it, maybe that person was it. And Andrew was the one who brought Peter to Christ and said, this is the one. And other people brought people to Christ and said, this is the one. So we have, um, we have the 12 apostles. And it's the inner circle beyond that, which was Peter, James, and John. And so I want to make sure I am on the right slide here that you guys see. Do you guys see definitions right now? Yes. All righty. Okay. So after that, we have uh, who was picked out. So when you think about everybody that uh, Christ picked out, um, he went on to a temple, or he went up to the, the mountain to pray, and he picked out his team, and he brought them all together. And he called them all apostles. And from that point on, we, we see the types of people that he's picked. And he's picked people who are fishermen, and blue-collar workers, and tax collectors, and people who are studious. He's picked all sorts of people, but they were ordinary people. They weren't people from the temple. They weren't people that were the priests. They were ordinary people. And he wanted them to do something extraordinary. And so he spent three years with them. And in that three years, they got to know him. He got to know them. So today we're going to talk about um, some interesting interactions that the disciples had, one with another and with Christ. We're going to talk about a little bit of their lack of faith. We're going to talk about an abundance of fear that they had. We're going to talk about just their slowness in general. They weren't very quick on the uptake for whenever Christ would say something profound or something deep, they would be scratching their heads. But they had a hunger for knowledge. They wanted to learn more and more and more. And we're also going to talk about Christ's patience with his disciples today. And repetition, repetition, repetition. There are certain things that Christ says oftentimes. And um, as a result, we see it frequently in the, in the gospel record, the same thing being said by Christ over and over and over again. We'll talk about one thing in particular later on. We'll also talk about the refusal of the apostles to understand, to believe, to really hear what Christ was saying, refusing to listen to it, because they had their own agenda. They had their own idea of what the Christ was supposed to do. Because after all, who could really believe that someone could be raised from the dead? So, 
just after we had um, our class last week, the immediately preceding that, you have the, the disciples getting together in a boat and going across the sea. And you have Mark chapter 4, starting out in verse 35. It says, That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. This is kind of a setup, don't you think? Christ is there. He's on one side. He wants to be um, alone with his disciples for a while. And so they leave the crowd behind. And when they leave him behind, they just take the boat. Now, you guys know what a fishing boat in the Galilee, in the Sea of Galilee, looks like? It's not a very sturdy vessel. The sides are fairly low. It has to be um, able to bring in fish over the edges. And so it's, it's a, a low boat, low to the ground. And so in verse 7, when it says, a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat, you can see what's happening. Now, most fishermen, when they see that a storm is coming, the first thing that they do is head to shore, especially if there's a, a big storm coming with lightning and heavy wind. But the captain of this, of this vessel was Christ, and he was uh, asleep. He was so soundly asleep that all this commotion was going on, and he was oblivious to it. It says that the vessel was nearly swamped. And you can see the disciples standing in the boat with the water up to their knees or somewhere mid-calf. And they are really afraid that this ship is going to sink. It says, Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. And the disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Jesus got up, he rebuked the wind and the waves, and he said, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and he was completely calm. Now you would think that that would be the end of the story. That they would continue on their journey, they would bail out the water that was in the boat. But he has a message for his disciples. He said, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith. They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? They take Christ's reproach and they say, Yes, we have very little faith. But think about what they've just done and what they've just been through. He's already asked them to go out and to preach, he's already had them do wonderful miracles, he's already seen um, them do great things, and they're afraid. See, the lesson for us in all of this is that Jesus knows when our storms are coming, just like he knew when this storm was coming. And as his disciples, we see this all around us, and we know that Christ is there. And even though it appears he may be sleeping, and not paying attention to what's going on. That is not the case. In fact, he wants you to understand the difficulty that you're in and to have faith in him. So the next interaction that I want to take a look at is found in Matthew chapter 16. It's going to be broken up into two different sections. First is the setup, and then is the lesson. So in Matthew chapter 16, if you want to turn there with your Bible, or you can follow along on the slide, it says the Pharisees and the Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. <coughs> he replied, when evening comes, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, today it will be stormy, for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation is always looking for a sign, but none will be given it 
except the sign of Jonah. Jesus then left them and he went away. So he has got some harsh words here for the, for the scribes and the Pharisees here. They, they want a sign. They want to see something marvelous. They want to see something awesome. It said of Herod that he wanted the same thing from Christ. He'd been waiting a long time to see who this man was because he wanted to see him do some miracle. He wanted to do, see him do something great. And it was the same thing here with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They wanted to, to have Jesus put on a show, if it were. And Jesus said, look around. Don't you see what is going on right now? Don't you see? Can't you have faith? Almost in reference to the, the time on the boat that we had just talked about. You know when good weather is here. You know when bad weather is coming. Now we have radar, so we see everything days before it comes. And we prepared for the, the big snowmageddon that we had here last week out on the East Coast. And then we knew that it was coming. We saw the signs. We saw the radar, and they were tracking it. They didn't have those types of luxuries back then. And Jesus is saying to them, you know what to look for, but you're not looking for it at all. You want the obvious, and I'm going to show you the hidden. So it says Jesus left them, and he went away. Now, immediately following this, they went across the lake again. And Jesus says, in a conversation that he's having with his disciples. Be careful, Jesus says. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And verse 7 is kind of a funny little verse here. It's, you can watch the disciples do what it describes. They discussed this among themselves and said, it's because we didn't bring any bread. Here they are, all talking amongst themselves, there's Jesus, probably up at the bow of the boat again. This is a trip that they often make, going to one side of the sea, to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And you have these conversations that the disciples have. You find this oftentimes in scriptures where Christ will say something, and then the disciples will all talk amongst themselves. What is he really talking about? What does he mean? What is he talking about? Well, Jesus is aware of this discussion. And he says, you of little faith, why are you talking amongst yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Do you, do you not remember the five loaves for the five thousand? And how many baskets will you gather? Or the seven loaves for the four thousand? And how many baskets will you gather? How is it you don't understand that I was not talking to you about bread? But be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It says, then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. When you think about, let me move this out of the way here. When you just think about all the tiny lessons that Christ has said, there's a lot of pieces that are hidden. They don't come out right away. You have to think about them. You have to really scratch your head. See, God wants us to think about hidden treasures. He wants us to think about metaphors. He wants us to think about what does light mean in comparison to God? What does bread mean when we talk about the body of Christ? What does wine mean when we think about the blood of Christ? Or a shepherd? How does that relate to Christ? Or a fortress? So all these metaphors are throughout the Bible. And God says, I want you to think about these things. So I might throw out a metaphor about yeast, Christ says. I want you to think about them. In the reference in Mark, which is the, uh, the same as what you've got in Matthew, it says Christ is aware of their discussion. And he asks them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? He says, you have eyes to see, but fail to see, and ears, but fail to hear. It's quite a scathing rebuke that 
Jeremiah gives to the people of Israel. And Christ quotes it. He quotes Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 21. You see, in this case, yeast is, is in the dough. And it's, this yeast is a, it's a contrary or a wicked way of thinking in ourselves. And we can pass that on to others. It's a sickness and a disease. And we have to be careful when we see it in ourselves and when we see it in our others. And we see it in others. And this is what Christ is warning them about. Next thing we want to take a look at as far as the interaction that the disciples had with Jesus comes after the sower and the seed. It's a very familiar passage. Um, the parable of the sower and the seed is something that we teach to our kids. And, and they probably can recite, but you have a sower. And what does he do? He spreads out his seed. And he picks up this conversation, it seems, out of nowhere in this chapter. Luke 8, if you wanted to turn to it, you, you read what precedes it and, it, and it comes out of nowhere. He just starts telling the story to everybody. There's a sower. He sows seed. And some of the seed goes on a path, and it gets trampled, and the birds eat it. And some of the seeds, it falls on rocky ground, but it can't take root, so it withers right away. And other seed, it's on thorny ground. And when the seed sprouts up, it gets choked out. And then he said, lastly, some of the seed is on good soil. And then after he says the story, he says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. It harkens back to what we were just talking about. Are you listening? Are you paying attention? Are you listening for the metaphor? Because I'm giving you a lesson, Christ says. Can you figure it out? And that's much of what the disciples had to do. Christ was speaking great things, <coughs> parables that had deep meanings, and they were scratching their heads trying to figure out what he was talking about. And so they asked, what does it mean? You guys know what a broadcast spreader is? It, you know, something that you might have for fertilizer, or something that you might have uh, for grass seed, or maybe when you think about a radio broadcast, what happens? You have something and you send it everywhere. It's irrespective of the audience. And so that is what Christ is doing. He is giving his broadcast to whomever will listen. And the disciples are there and ready to ask and say, what does it mean? And this is what Christ wants from them. He doesn't want them to, to talk amongst themselves and to say, what does he mean? What, what is he? I don't understand what he's saying. They, Christ wants them to come to him and say, what do you mean by this? So his disciples asked him, and he said, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to others I speak in parables, so that though seeing they may not see, and though hearing they may not understand. And he says, this is the meaning of the parable. And the seed is the word of God. See, so the, the lesson for us is Christ is very patient. He's patient with us, and we'll explain if we ask him. But we have to ask ourselves. Do we have the ears that it takes to hear what he has to say? Do we have inquiring minds? It's good to get into the Word, to study things that God has, has laid out for us, whether they are stories in Genesis or whether they are prophecy, or whether it's the Psalms and the Proverbs where great wisdom is spoken. It's good to dig into it, and that's what God wants us to do. In Mark chapter 4, in a, in a parallel passage to this, it says, When he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parable. So when you think about the, the disciples and the apostles and who they were, think about Mark chapter 4, verse 10. In this verse, it's not just the twelve who continue to be with Christ. 
these others who are interested in what he has to say. And they ask him about it. And they ask him about the parables. James chapter 1 verse 5 says, Ask wisdom from God, he who gives liberally without finding fault. Ask God for wisdom. The disciples had the wisest man ever right there with him. There was no better person to ask. And so they did. The next account of the interaction that I wanted to take a look at has to do with uh, a man named Lazarus. There was a man named Lazarus. He was a good friend of Jesus. He had two sisters, Mary and Martha. Mary and Martha took care of Lazarus, and he was old, but he was sick and about to die. And in this sickness, word gets to Jesus and his disciples that Lazarus is close to death. And by the time the word gets to them, Jesus knows that he is already dead. But he says he's asleep. And his disciples replied, Lord, if he's sleeping, he will get better. Verse 13 continues, Jesus had been speaking of his death. But his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. And then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go that we may die with him. What a strange thing to say. Well, not so strange if you know the context, because this is near the end of Christ's ministry. And people had been saying to Jesus, the scribes and the Pharisees, they're looking for a way to kill you. They're looking for a way to get rid of you. And so the disciples knew that if Jesus was to go to Jerusalem, he would die. And they knew that if Jesus gets closer and closer to Jerusalem and Lazarus lived right in Jerusalem's back door, uh, there's a little town of Bethany, which is just south and towards the, um, the Dead Sea. If he went there, it's very likely that he would die. And all the other disciples said the same thing as Thomas said. Let us go that we may die with him. We're not afraid of death. Jesus takes this as a, a teachable moment. right? So he wanted to dispel rumors that... Um, where he, I guess he didn't want to give sway to the rumors that they were looking for a way to kill him. He wanted to, to teach them that death is the same thing as sleep in God's eyes. He also wanted to teach his the disciples so the, that they could see the power of God because God has the power to resurrect somebody who has even started to rot as Lazarus had done by now. He wanted to show them the, the power of God. So Thomas here, he kind of misses the meaning of the sleep, but he has devotion and courage in his heart. He's not the only one who says things like this, because Peter says this as well. I will even die with you if I have to. I will never disown you. When things like that are said, all the others say the same thing. But it's the one who leads and says, even if I have to die with you, that gets the recognition for it. So for here, Thomas is the one that says it. In another place, when Peter says it, he gets the recognition for it. The lesson for us in this is many people have good intentions. They may think that they know how they will behave in a particular circumstance, but the reality oftentimes is different. The disciples thought they knew what Jesus was thinking, but they didn't. Thomas thought that he would go to his death being with Jesus, but we know from the story later on, that's not what happened. So I want to take just a few minutes to prepare you for the next section. And that is hearing something over and over again and still not listening refusing to to understand what Christ has said. Not that you don't understand it, but refusing to understand it. 
Some of it has to do with their own slowness sometimes. Sometimes it has to do with their own proclivities. We want something to be a particular way, but it's not that way. So it was with the disciples. Let's see here. There we go. The big question to tackle in our next section here. How many times did Jesus tell his disciples that he was going to die? Now, if you guys have studied the Bible a lot, you might say a couple times. If you haven't studied the Bible a lot, you might guess and say oh, five, six times. I'm not sure how many times. Maybe once, maybe twice. Well, this is not an exhaustive search by any means, but from what I've done, looking through the gospel records of when Jesus says he's going to die, sometimes they are allusions to death, for instance, like Jonah being in the belly of the whale for three days, so Christ will be in the earth and then raised. Some are allusions like that. Some are flat-out facts that Jesus states, I will die and I will be raised from the dead. I see five in Matthew, I see two in Mark, two in Luke, and six in John, many of which are at the very last, uh, at the last supper. In Matthew, taking a quick look at a couple of these, starting at chapter 12, he answered, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but there will be none given except for the sign of the prophet Jonah. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And that's a bit of a parable, isn't it? That's something that the disciples would scratch their head and wonder, what is he talking about? And they would have to piece it together. But as you see later on in the story, so now we're going to Matthew 16. It says, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. When you read that, you understand that the story of Lazarus being raised from the dead and the disciples saying, we'll go with you, we'll die with you, it's linked to what Christ has already told them and they've already heard. They know that he is going to suffer many things and be killed. Matthew 20 says, Now Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, and on the way he took the twelve aside, and he said to them, We're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death, and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and on the third day he will be raised to life. That is so plainly spoken, isn't it? Jesus says very clearly, very simply, I am going to die. And so it is with all the other passages. So we'll quickly go through those through those now. Mark and Luke. Similar things. Mark chapter 9 says, They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know they were there because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant, and they were afraid to ask him about it. Now, well, that's the same old problem that we had before, isn't it? I'm not sure what Christ is saying. He can't really mean that he's really going to die. He is the Messiah, after all. He is the Son of God. So why is he saying he is going to die? Why is he saying he's going to suffer? This can't be right. I must not be understanding what he's telling me. This must be some type of parable, and I'm just not, I'm not seeing where he's going with it. Because he can't really mean that he's going to die. Christ is so patient with his disciples. In John, it says, The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you prove to us your authority to do all this? Always looking for a sign. This is the 
third reference today where people are looking for a sign and refusing to see everything that's going on all around them. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Ah, so there we have it again. Another parable, another metaphor. Because the temple he was talking about was not the real temple. They sneered at him how long it had taken to build the temple and they said Christ could rebuild it in three days. No way. But Christ was talking about his body. John 13 says, Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where am I going? You cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. This is what the disciples said oftentimes. But Jesus' reply to them was, you don't realize now what I am doing. But later, you are going to understand. I'm telling you now, before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe who I am. So at the Last Supper, John, in his Gospel, takes great pains to record a lot of events that the other Gospels don't have at the Last Supper. A lot of the interaction that uh, the disciples have with Jesus and that Jesus has with them. They're still trying to get from Jesus what is going to happen. They have the sense that something is mounting, that something is coming, that it is inevitable and soon. And they want they want clarity from Christ, but they just don't have it. He says he's going away, and Peter says, Where are you going? Jesus says, You can't follow me, but, but you will later. And, and Thomas, he says, We don't know where you're going, and we don't know the way. And, and then Jesus gives him more metaphor. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Christ talks about going to the Father, but that they've seen the Father. Philip says, show us the Father, show us the Father. And Christ is like, how long have I been with you guys? Haven't you seen what I've done? Haven't you seen what I've said? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In John chapter 14, verses 28, and 29. The reason is given for some of this. It's when Jesus says, I tell you I am going away and coming back ahead of time so that when it happens, you will believe. Well, if you're familiar with the gospel record, you understand that they, they didn't believe when it happened. Let's take a look at some of this. Uh, everything made clear, yes. So this is this is Christ telling his disciples, um, without any without any veil, without any metaphor, what is going to happen to them. So we know very clearly that the disciples could see what was supposed to happen to Christ. It's a matter of whether they believed that it was actually going to happen. At the Last Supper, in verse 25 of John 16, Jesus says. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. But the hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day, you will ask in my name. I do not say to you that you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world. And now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. His disciples said, Ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. This is what they wanted. They, they didn't want to have to think about it too much. They wanted to be told plainly what Christ was going to do. 
now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. And Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming, and indeed it has come, when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and you will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take heart, he says, I have overcome the world. So this is a heavy load for the disciples to take. First, he says, I'm going to die. Second, he says, you're going to scatter, and you're going to leave me alone. Well, if they didn't believe really that he was going to die, I don't think that they believed that they would leave him alone either. They had great ambitions regarding uh, protecting Christ. We read about Thomas saying it earlier, and about Peter saying it earlier, all of them professing their love for Christ, and that they would not run away. Christ is trying to make it very clear to them what is going to happen. But at the same time, give them reassurance. So it wasn't so very clear for them, even though at the Last Supper they all understood what Christ was saying. It was shortly after that where they went to the Garden of Gethsemane. And at the Garden of Gethsemane, Christ was arrested. And after a short trial, he was put on the cross. And he hung there. And then he died. And they looked in disbelief at what was going on. He said he was going to die, but they really didn't think that he was. They thought he was going to be the one to save them from Rome. It didn't happen the way they thought. It's crazy. So what does happen? He gets buried in the tomb, and for three days, they sit around wondering what went wrong, wondering how it happened, wondering if they should go fishing again. That's what Peter decides to do. I'm bored. I want to go fishing. And so he does. But on the third day, Mary goes down to the tomb, and Jesus sees her there and gives her a message and says, Go tell my brothers. And the account in Matthew has the typical response that you'd expect from people who have little faith. I count myself with that because I don't think I would have done anything different. It's easy with the hindsight glasses to say, I would not do that. I would never, you know, I wouldn't have done that. It's easy to do that. But the reality was, of the 12 disciples, all of them ran. Mark 16 says, When they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, they believed. No, that's not what that says. It says they did not believe. They couldn't believe it. There is no way that something like that could happen. You see, what's the lesson there for us? If somebody tells you something incredible that they heard on the news, Let's say an earthquake happened, and it swallowed up an entire country. Something crazy like that. You might believe it. If somebody says, this person was raised from the dead after being dead for three days, why is that so hard to believe when you consider the power of God? It says afterwards, Jesus appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking in the country. These two men were on their way to Emmaus. They returned and reported it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Isn't that odd? Not one eyewitness, not two eyewitnesses, 
but even more. Verse 14, later, Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Ah, uh, yeah. This is Christ working with the people that he had picked. Christ went up onto the mountain and picked 12 people out of this mass of disciples, knowing full well that they would have faith issues. Knowing And he does that so that later on we see that Christ can forgive. We know Christ has high expectations of us. That's for sure. But he has forgiveness as well. Doubting Thomas. How would you like that to be the epitaph in your grave? The person who doubted that Christ had risen the person that said, I needed to put my finger in his hands and see the sword mark in the side before I believe. That was Thomas. So even Thomas, after being told by the disciples and everybody else that Christ had been raised from the dead, he still says, there is no way that Christ rose from the dead. Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand to his side, I will not believe. Incredible. And after saying this, a week later, they're all in the house, still trying to figure out what's going on. Can you imagine this? So Christ has been raised from the dead. Some people have seen him, but things have changed. It is not the same as it was before Christ's death. But they're all in a house together. But Christ isn't there with them. Christ is somewhere else, doing something else. And his appearance can change. Even to the point where two men can be walking and talking, and they not understand who this person is that they're talking to. And they'd spent the better part of three years with them. So it says, though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he singles Thomas out. Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand. Put it into my side. And he says to him what he says to us. Stop doubting and believe. So, for Thomas, seeing was believing, wasn't it? But we're all in the position here of actually never seeing the death and resurrection of Christ. And yet, we have faith, and we have the ability to believe. We read the gospel, we take the account, and we take it as gospel, as truth. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God, then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And so that, he says to us as we read it, what a great and marvelous thing. So, to wrap things up for tonight, we have to ask ourselves, are we any different than the apostles when we take a look at the interactions that, that they had are we any different? The answer is no. No. We're, we're blue-collar workers. We're studious. We're white-collar workers. We, it goes all over the board. We have great expectations of ourselves of what we will do and how we will serve Christ and yet fail at the same time. We get lost in the metaphors in the Bible and we scratch our heads when we when we read different things from, let's say, the Song of Solomon, reading about the bride there, or when we read in the Proverbs, different metaphors there. 
or in prophecies. We're no different. We scratch our heads and we have a hard time understanding it. We forget about God's great expectations for us. We lay them aside because we have other priorities that are more important. Lastly, we forget that in times of trouble, that Christ is there with us on the boat, even while it appears to be sinking. Christ will save us. So next week, uh, we'll be talking about uh, Peter. We want to go through Peter's life, because there is a wealth of information regarding Peter, and uh, I want to see what we can find from that to uh, get a lesson on how to make um, our faith stronger and our, our lives better. So with that, um, do we have any questions before we close with a prayer? I like the part, this is just kind of a dimension this, that like you said, he didn't call any priest. You know, there were no priests that served in the temple in his group at all. I mean, there were a few that kind of looked maybe afar off, but Nicodemus, you know, was in the Sanhedrin. Yeah. He had some, you know, relationship, but for the most part, you know, he called no priest, no temple personnel, no scribes, uh, no. as he quoted, you know, he said those that would condemn him would be scribes and teachers of the law and the high priests and chief priests. But isn't right. that, he was just so revolutionary, you know, for his time. Yeah. There was not even a vestige that he could, you know, see in them that he could work with. What does that say about establishment? Yeah, even today, perhaps. Um, and even Nicodemus had the same issues that the rest of the disciples had because Christ chastises him. And after he says, you must be born again, Nicodemus is scratching his head saying, can a man be born again and enter into his mother's womb? And Jesus says, you're a teacher of Israel and you don't understand these things? So the same admonishment that he gives to his disciples, he gives to Nicodemus. And he wants us to think about things spiritually. He wants us to see the metaphors that God lays out as something that's wonderful, something that's amazing. Yes. Definitely. And, you know, the wicked and adulterous generation that seeks for a sign. I mean, we all kind of, you know, watch the news at night and we're seeing the signs kind of the end time put together, but we're not just solely seeking signs, you know, for a display or a, a show. We're... We're just seeking them with hum humbleness, and then also, you know, we're going to live for him whether we think, you know, he's coming today or tonight or tomorrow, or we don't want to pray. So, but um, also, kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven, can they be used interchangeably? It is the kingdom of God which comes from heaven, right? So from the very beginning, from the time of Adam and Eve, God has a plan for the people of earth. So, God dwells in the heavens, and the kingdom is going to be on the earth, as it talks about in Isaiah, and as Christ talks about in his prayer, which we call the Lord's Prayer. It is something that we look forward to, is the, the kingdom on earth, but it comes from heaven. It is the kingdom of heaven. Um. And then when, uh, when you say, you know, in John 14, I'm going away to prepare a place for you, that where I am there, mm -hmm. and all that. Yep. Um, you know, and like I'm coming out of that. Is that heaven or is that back on earth or whatever? I'm working through those things. But anyway, but when he, when he said, show us the Father, and, he, and well, I'm wondering why he put it this way, have I been with you so long time? He didn't say, uh, yeah. haven't I revealed for two years the truth of God. Haven't I embodied God? Haven't I been? Yeah. Haven't I been with you? So is he yes. claiming to be the Father at that point? I think that's different. I think what you have is Christ using uh, manifestations. So God with us, that was his name from Isaiah. Emmanuel, right? So when you have somebody who embodies uh, the principles of God, it is no different than God saying to David, you are a man after my own heart, right? 
if, if you see the character of David, you see the character of God because it is somebody who is like God in their desires and their intentions. So when you see somebody, even my own son, if you were to see him and you were to talk with him, or a better example is my father and myself, because when people see me and have never met me before, but they've met and know well my father, they know who I come from just because of how I look and how I act. They know what, that I'm not Arden, my father, but because of how I behave, how I talk, my mannerisms, it's a clear reflection of where I came from. And so it is with Christ. He is a clear reflection of who he came from. And his father taught him from a very early age, instructing him, and even at the age of 12, wanting to go to the temple, he needed to be about his father's business. He had that mindset which set him apart from everybody else. It didn't mean that he was God, very God. It meant that he shared that common purpose and that common way of thinking, which was so different than the disciples. So other things like when he says, I am the water of life, I am the light of the world, I am, all these I am statements, that doesn't mean that he is the eternal God. That means that he's reflecting the eternal God. It's kind of a metaphor. Okay. Those are, I am the shepherd. It, he really wasn't a shepherd, was he? Right? So when he says, I am the good shepherd, but metaphorically, he was. Right, right. He didn't give the Samaritan woman water that she never thirsted again with. But metaphorically, that was the water that he gave her. Okay, and then that body, that last thing, that resurrected body, you know, he appeared, quote, in a different form. So I've always been amazed by that account of the two or the two guys or whatever, a couple guys on the road to Emmaus. You said yeah. they, they were kind of with the Lord for about three years, but yet he... Yes. yes. If they were his disciples, and there's no reason to doubt that they were his disciples... They said, are, are you a stranger here? You don't know about all these things, and you don't know about Jesus? So obviously the two men walking did know a lot about Jesus and explained to him this, this terrible thing that had happened. And then Jesus turns the tables on them and says, this is what the law and the prophets have said. This is why he had to die. And then they, they encouraged him to come with him, and Jesus pretended like he was going somewhere else. They, they didn't even recognize who he was, though they had been with him. Until and they were so amazed when he revealed himself, they, they went off right away and told the disciples, which was uh, seven, eight miles away. Yeah. It was, yeah, it was, it's an amazing story there. You know, After the resurrection of Christ, how many people saw him, and the disciples still said, I, I don't believe it. There's no way. And they, they saw Lazarus risen from the dead, and he was in the grave for four days, and he stung. Things like that, I think, would give the disciples reason to believe that Jesus could be raised from the dead, as well as Jesus' confidence that his father would raise him from the dead. And in that body, he could eat, too, because he was preparing fish one time on the shore. Yep, on the shore, yep. And yeah. his body appears differently, but yet it can eat food. Yeah, next week we're going to talk about that when we talk about Peter in his conversion. So that's, um, I'll save my thoughts on that for that week. So amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Let's bow our heads and pray. Our Father who art in heaven, we thank you that you are a patient God. And we thank you for sending your Son into this world that we might learn from him and we would see his example, we would see his character, and we would try to emulate it, just as he tried to emulate you. We pray, Lord, that you would make us complete, that we would be good fishers of men, and we would be good disciples of your Son. Help us this week in these goals, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Oh, thank you very much again, Jason. And you know, Lord willing, we will see you next week. Thank you all for having me, and uh, 
look forward to next week. And if you want to study up on Peter, uh, that'd be a great idea. Okay. All right. Thank you. Good night. Good night.